So I'm going to hit you guys with another tutorial here, and then I'm going to start recording some of these things and putting them on schedule because they're eating up a lot of my time while doing the videos. And I think I could spend maybe like a Sunday doing multiples and have some stuff going out every week. Uh, once a week, maybe, I think. That should work out a little bit better. Um, here's the thing. When you hear guys talking, they're like, Boolean in-gun workflow, subdivision workflow. It's all modeling. There is no such thing as advanced 3D modeling, in my opinion. It's just modeling, and you're going to use the tools that are available to you to make whatever it is you want to make. So if you're going to use subdivision, and you start creating something like this, doing some loop cuts or whatever, at some point, you can take this resolution up, and you'll have something like this, right? It's a form. And so what hit me one day, I was watching another guy using subdivision, but he was in, I think he was in a CAD software using it. And he... um. He was using it just to explore form first. And so when you turn on the end result here with the subdivision modifier, this is really hard to use sometimes because what, what you're actually working on is the cage, right? So you're not working on this, you're working on this, but this displays the cage on this. And so sometimes you'll end up doing something and it'll start wigging out and it'll look crazy. But if you understand what's going on underneath it, then you'll have a little bit better of a time with uh, doing this. Anyways, but the idea here still stands of what we're going to be doing. We're exploring form, right? You see how we can just start shifting things around and start playing with ideas? Like, yeah, it's not all super sharp or hard or anything like that. So, uh, you know, we can add additional extrusions. We can do insets, whatever the case. Uh, the more complicated we make this, though, the harder this is going to be to work with, potentially. So we want to just explore big ideas, perhaps and uh, not work with necessarily like nuanced details uh, just yet. We're just going with the form, okay? And so as we work with this, and we can rotate things, scale them, we can extrude them, you can see we're coming up with some cool form. This isn't, you know, it's maybe just kind of like a three-dimensional shape. That's what form is. Shapes are 2D, forms are 3D. Uh, but you can see we can control E and bridge edge loops here. All right, you can see that didn't work out. Why? Well, let's see what's going on underneath. When we bridge it, it does that number. So. We can't bridge that like that, just not yet anyways. And so we can work it out. Try to work it out anyways. And Alt-Z, Extrude, and now we can start to maybe bridge these two. Maybe this will work out. That's a little bit closer. Okay. Got to be able to grab loops sometimes, and you can see something still went wrong here. Uh, we don't have a center edge on the bottom. So I'm going to symmetrize across this way, okay? Now we'll try that again. Using Mesh Machine to symmetrize, by the way. All right, now we have something. GG twice. All right, subdivide that, and you'll see that it looks like so. So you got to be able to be kind of fluid here. you got to be able to go back and forth with these tools and uh, work with them a little bit. All right, so now we're getting something kind of interesting. We take an edge and pull it out. You see where that's going? Okay, and so the Boolean ingon workflow can be comboed up with subdivision. This isn't an uh, unknown fact here that we can do things like that. But uh, what's more interesting is instead of just doing simple box cuts and things like that, we still do this with other forms. Okay, so we can start creating our other shapes. And we can start twisting these things around and contorting them heavily, adding loop cuts to sharpen them up a bit, maybe running them through the shape a lot further. Uh, you can still do knife cuts. You can use triangles. I'd, I'd avoid using ingons if possible, but uh, you could use triangles. And you can see how that's kind of working out here. So I need to do a knife cut KCA, knife cut up, loop cut to the front. When you have a triangle, and you loop cut to the back of it, that turns it into a quad, just so you know. Uh, but you can see what's going on now. We're, we're able to start working this thing out little by little. And what we're going to do here is we're going to subdivide it, shade it smooth. We're going to take it and Boolean subtract it from this one real quick. And you can see what kind of result we get here. All right, so a lot of times they don't Boolean together very well. You shade it auto smooth, and you'll see that a lot of the edges will get cleaned up. But it's still not going to be a perfect result. Hit Q and E if you're using hard ops. Bring that cutter back. But we can start to do things 
and try out different ideas here with these kinds of forms, right? This is where you're going to get into that more complicated looking stuff potentially because this is, you know, it's, it's just a shape. I'm going to symmetry or mirror, excuse me, using machine tools. But we're able to start working out these different kind of ideas like this now. And so we can continue with this process. Let me put the 3D cursor back to the scene center so I can create in the middle. There. And so now I just want to pull that one and kind of have the same thing happen here, just a little bit different. Okay. Could have duplicated that one maybe. But we'll we'll try this out. We'll subdivide it a few times. Do the Boolean subtraction. We'll see how it works out. Here. Oop. Okay, yeah. I don't know why those ones came back, but it did. We'll scale it in. Okay. Now let's duplicate this one and put it back here. Rotate it. We'll do it this way. Okay. Uh, don't care for that one as much. We could probably grab these end ones over here. Actually, let's dissolve the middle for a second. We can start to maybe pull that out like that. All right, now we're getting somewhere with that. Okay, so we're chiseling away at this form and starting to do some traction. So we're getting negative space. These are indentations, so they're negative space. Positive space would be coming out of it, right? Uh, doing positive space this way is a lot. I'd say a lot more challenging in a way. Actually, not really. It's kind of the same deal, but it can be challenging. Let's see what I'm talking about here. Because uh, you're changing the silhouette ultimately, right? So if I do a couple loop cuts through there real quick, we get something like that going on. You can also put proportional edit to work. So check this out. If I take all of these and I hit Shift H, turn this proportional edit on, I press G shift Z, do something like that maybe, hold H back out or forward slash, get back out of isolation mode. So now we have something like this happening. I kind of want to rotate it from this edge though, and it's really hard to do. So let's just hide it for a second, or yeah, we'll hide it. Let's shift right click in the 3D cursor. I've talked about modifying tools before, I'm going to recover it real quick. Key map. Look for the knife, or excuse me, you look for 3D cursor in this case. You can modify your tools in the default startup behavior. For mine, for example, I've set um, orientation, it's usually by at none by default, I think, or view or something. Uh, I set it to geometry. So every time you shift right click this 3D cursor, it tries to line up, I believe, to the local space of the object, but it might be the normal. I'll have to recheck that one. But whatever the case, it seems to work out really well. So I can now use this 3D cursor as like a little hinge point. When I press Alt-H, bring this back, shade it smooth, you'll see that we can now set this to uh, 3D cursor, right? Our cursor here. We should be able to rotate off of that 3D cursor. That's not it. Wrong one. I always get these backwards. 3D cursor over here. And you might want to do cursor and cursor, actually. So we should be able to rotate in that area. See how it's actually rotating. Yeah, see it is rotating from the 3D cursor. But we want it to go along in this direction, right? So we press R and X and it rotates. Not quite the way I want it, but we can go back to global. And this is where machine tools will save you a ton of time. You see how we could just set to cursor? And it does cursor and cursor. Or global, global and medium point, individual, okay. Huge time saver not having to fiddle around with those things. Uh, but we can do this, so if I want to do local, bam. See how that works out? I think I lost my local rotation. So maybe we use the uh, the cursor again. See, we can kind of rotate in that area. Kind of interesting that you can do that. But basically, if we want to start combining things together, this is how we could go about doing that, perhaps. I figure this direction will look good. Let's modify the shape a bit. You can see this is still hidden. Alt-H. Bring it back. Sometimes you'll forget that, that you did that, and it's just... It, um, yeah, it's just weird at first, the first time that happens, because you're like, what's what's going on with my mesh? Okay, that's looking much nicer like that. There we go. It's coming down through here. Rotate that. You see proportional edit goes a long way as well. All right, so this is where you're going to start getting those really cool design ideas going that you just simply don't see in most 
3D modeling tutorials because this is all about design here. This is not about 3D modeling at the end of the day, right? Oops, I keep hitting the wrong keys apparently. And this needs some thickness to it back here. It doesn't have any. And I'm not sure how I would pull that off the way I want. Turn proportional on it off. I might do that right there like so. Um, but I don't really like that either. Let's turn off all these, I guess, for now. I want to see what I can do in the back side here. Um, this can go thicker here a little bit maybe, but... Yeah, we'd have to drag that in, I think. Get anything kind of the way I want it. Right, so you see where that's going now. We'll turn them all back on and we can see our whole shape again. We could subdivide this more or less if needed. Um, oh, there we go. We have something started at least. It's a little bit more interesting than what we once had. Okay. And we can always do box cuts too. Sometimes this is actually preferable because look, if I cut here with a, a boolean, right? Go ahead and symmetrize it over, or mirror it, excuse me. You'll see we get some other shapes like this. And this, this is where things are going to get pretty rough. Because look, if we do a hard ops here, we're going to do mesh tools, face extract, hold shift when clicking this. We'll click this here and hit spacebar. It will extract it, right? We have to do that first because I don't know the actual key combo to do this. But um, what we'll see here is that we can decimate this thing. Okay, it's kind of hard to see what it's doing, but we can decimate it. And if we're careful about this decimation, we won't mess up. Oops, <laughs> we won't mess it up. Yeah, uh, we should be able to decimate it a little bit. It should clean it up a bit, I think. Oh, it didn't. Oh, it doesn't. You have to extrude it first, I think, before you do that. So let's just go ahead and scale it down. Extrude it in. On forward slash, so we can see what's going on. Alt in, recalculate outside. Okay, there we go. You see the decimation taking place now. So this decimation can clean it up a little bit, but it's a little tricky, right? Like it doesn't give you maybe a perfect result, but it it gets close. Basically, we're cleaning it up though. That's the main idea. So you can apply the decimate. You can see we mostly have quads left over. Some things might still have doubles and el elsewhere, but we could just control X, dissolve some of these things, almost like a little heart shape. And that's just going to be a way cleaner mesh now. And so we can go ahead and push this into this area as well. Shift S and then do um, origin to geometry. That could be useful. So the origin points over here, not way over there. Now, here's where things get even interestinger. Is that a word? I don't know. Um, we can do quad remeasure on top of these things. This is a simple shape. You probably don't need nothing more than like a couple hundred for it. And use normal splitting if you want. Adapt the size up if you want. Um, we're not going to symmetrize, but a lot of times you can get these to remesh perfectly to a subdivision mesh. All right. So this is why this becomes so fun using quad remesher. And this is exactly why I bought this add-on. It's not so that I get perfect sub D quad meshes for renders and things like that. It's so that I can work faster on some things. So if I'm doing like concepts, for example, uh, we're going to select, select by sharp. It marked everything sharp. I can hit shift H and now I can grab like maybe just this center point, use proportional edit. And you can see I can roll this out like that. And now we have this kind of a shape. So if I add a couple loop cuts in here, I'll H it back and subdivide this, shade it smooth a few times. There we go. We could pull this out a little bit, something like that. We could do a Boolean subtraction with it. And you can see where that's going. Maybe it's a little too high res though. Let's do uh, one subdivision on it, All right? But now we're able to start working these kinds of shapes and forms in a completely different manner than what, what we once were. And we can still do that on other ones we've already created as well. So you can see here, this was a very simplistic shape. To start with, if we do like a level one or level two subdivision, apply it, uh, we might have a little bit more geometry data here now that we can do other kind of little form changes. Okay, 
And so you can see there, when we subdivide this again, you can see how those forms actually start to take place now on this surface. It's um, quite a bit different. You can go kind of extreme with this stuff sometimes too. Like if I pull that all the way up, you can see what it's doing. We're getting way different results out of that than you probably anticipated. And um, that's what's just fun about this whole process. And the only thing is, is that as you go through this, uh, you may have to retopo this, right? That's that's the thing that can and probably will happen. Uh, quadri mesher, as much as I like it, it does miss a lot of stuff. I was hoping to get more mileage out of it than I, I got out of it, but um, it still can be quite a useful tool just to have in case. But it does sometimes need to be manually retopo later. And you could make this much more efficiently. And there's no reason you shouldn't think about um, manually retopoing it later. Okay, so you can see we can end up with something like that. And we'll keep going through this process potentially. Uh, we can do ingon cuts as well. If you're going to do cuts, I would turn off live preview personally. And just if you want to leave them as modifiers, because uh, sometimes it can get slow. But uh, other than that, you shift click, go into edit mode, you might be able to run your bevels and things like that. You can see we're starting to get some more interest here going. And then once again, uh, you know what, let's do that other side too. Everything's nice and curved except for that piece there. So, Oh, you know what? We didn't even bevel that side. We just chamfered it. Let's go back. Let's bevel it. Okay. We can bevel that side. And then once again, we're back to the face extract, right? Select the object first can click and drag with it. It sometimes misses the selection, but can do that. You can see what's going on there. So I didn't hit shift. So this time it's going to act different. I have to uh, press space bar and then hold shift and it'll try to inset right away. And this is, I don't really care for this behavior, that immediate inset like that, because I need to clean it up first. So you know what? Let's not do that. Instead, let's just go ahead and hold shift, face extract, drag through. Okay. Now we can hit space bar. We got our, our separate piece here. And you have to clean these things up usually because of this nonsense right here. All right. Now, here's something else you could also do that's kind of cool. You could probably take all this and just extrude it up real quick. All right. And with Mesh Machine, you can grab an edge, alt click it. You can shift W or I have it set as shift W. You can hit Y. You can do the Boolean cleanup. And um, it may or may not work here on this one. I'm not sure if it will work out. But a lot of times you can get away with stuff like that, which is kind of fun. That's a lot of extra edges in there that we don't really need. And you're probably thinking, like, how are we going to solve this problem with all these extra pieces? I'm just trying to figure out a good balance here. You can hold shift and move it. It goes a little bit slower. Okay, I think that's as good as that's going to get. I'm going to click. All right. In this top section here, all of this, make sure you select it all. X, delete vertices. All right. So now we have this shape here. You could try to inset this now. And we might still get errors we have to clean up, but we can inset it at least. All right. And we can forward slash if it's getting too complicated. You can see sometimes things, yeah, they just don't work out quite the way you want them to. So um, instead of even trying to clean that up right now, I'm just going to go through the shape, press Control I, X, and delete these right there, like that. We're going to cheat the system. We're going to go bypass all that, hopefully. And we still got some weird leftovers hanging out here. Machine Tools cleanup feature sometimes knocks those things out, but in this case, it did not. Symmetrize. I think we'll be okay with that. Okay, so now we could just simply press E, hit Z twice to move straight up. A, Alt N, recalculate outside your normals. Um, turn on back face colon, guys. I mean, I know everybody wants to use this show correct face thing. No, back face colon. Once you understand that faces go forward or backwards and they become hollow on the backside, much easier to deal with, in my opinion. Uh, sometimes it's a little confusing at first, but. Once you get the hang of it, it's not bad. So we can do a Boolean subtraction with that one. And you can see this one here 
you know we could leave it like this but look it doesn't you know it's faceted looking and all that so actually let's not do that yet you know, we have quad remesher why not let's just go ahead and remesh it you can see it got it pretty well we could have even symmetrized this one if we wanted to make sure it gets even nicer and we can subdivide it all right so at this point we can use this on the surface if we wanted to leave it like that potentially right we could just sit it there i mean maybe it's like a little piece of rubber that's stuck in there or something or we could pull it down and maybe shade it smooth and do a boolean subtraction and we'll have this nice curved kind of setup in here as well that didn't work out quite as good as it possibly could have but overall i'd say it's not too bad but that ingon you can see the ingons do in fact cause problems guys this is why you need to get used to working with these tools sometimes because this whole section here if we press i and then o we could just maybe do an outset like so and we might be able to correct that. You can see it also went a little bit crazy over here for some reason. Not sure why that one did that like that. Okay, so the other alternative here is if you can select the loop all the way around. You see, actually, we don't need that. We don't need that edge like that. Quadri measure got it wrong. All right, so here's what we're going to do instead. Uh, it's kind of getting hard to work with when, when it's in a wireframe view. I hate the wireframe view personally but if you um go to mesh settings i think it is you can shade or settings shade solid real quick so we can just see it solid shaded real quick we can see it work with it real quick and we can set it back to wireframe after this one i already saw what was kind of going on that i didn't like which was this down here this edge does not need to exist i think something more like that okay there's a big end gone down here and we would have to work that out possibly but we could just do that get rid of that and apparently up here as well we can get rid of that one so we'll leave it like that for now i think that's better we do we might have to symmetrize it though all right so all right now back to where we were you select a sharp edge shift g select sharpness and you can see it selected these ones as well these don't need to be sharp what's going on there clear sharps there Symmetrize. Okay, try that again. Shift G. Well, there's two ways you can do it. You can do it like that, where you Shift G, select by sharpness, and maybe add a bevel or a chamfer or something to this. Uh, but you can grab a loop going around an object as well. Then you can do boundary select. So all these selection methods are up here. Edge loops, rings, boundary loop is huge. You can do that. You can hit Control B and you can bevel it as well. And set the shape to a one, and you'll get a nice sharp bevel like that. Potentially, and so we can see that it's here. Uh, it's still doing the boolean, but we got to set it back to um, settings and shade uh, as wire again. So we'll get that result there. All right. So you can see how this is all starting to come together closer and closer. Now this original subdivision as well, we could bump up the count here a little bit, and you'll see uh, if you set it high enough, you start to work those little issues out like that. But in reality, uh, these are going to be kind of unavoidable with, with this workflow. Um, later on you might get lucky like if we have a whole shape here let's do a boolean union of that real quick and um, let's say we have a whole shape like this um, i would duplicate it personally and convert it to a mesh and then pull it out over here and shade it auto smooth but some of these edges you might just want to go through and control click through them and then hit control e and mark it sharp right and that's going to help out a little bit with that shading issue in that particular place um, and we want to just get some of these here on the sides real quick you could click and then alt click with mesh machine as well and just mark that whole edge sharp it wouldn't hurt it none um, you can do that on all of them pretty much so we'll see here some of them just get missed that's fine but a lot of these will work out like that so we'll do that with mesh machine from here on out i think nice little convenient selection method right Sometimes they go like in different directions that you don't want them to, but I think that one worked out. As long as it didn't go through the front, it didn't. And now, that sharp. Come like that sharp. You just symmetrize it real quick. Hopefully that'll work out. Let's see if I missed anything real quick. We'll kind of review it. So far it looks pretty good. I think I'm gonna mark 
I kind of want to mark this one sharp here too. Just so if I hit this with quad remesher, that'll actually hold position there, I think. And um, some of the other ones, we could mark sharp like this one. But it's not necessarily required because it was already kind of sharp, I think. But it wouldn't hurt either, so just might as well do it. All right, so we'll go ahead and symmetrize. Now, here's the thing. We want to make sure it's clean, so we run machine tools cleanup feature. You can see it got rid of some stuff. I don't know what it got rid of exactly or where, but it did. So that's something that happened. Also, this edge here doesn't need to be sharp. And this edge here doesn't need to be sharp. What needs to be sharp is the one in the corner right here. Okay, and this one right here also needs to be sharp, I think. And somehow they're crossing. I don't know how it did that. All right, well, we'll go with it. We'll see what happens. So we don't have any material splits occurring. We only have marked sharps. So that's going to be splitting the normals. So that's what use normal splitting is. We can detect hard edges by angle as well. We can do symmetry. With any luck, this will quad remesh, but it's going to be a higher polygon count than this. Actually, I don't think it'll be too high either. I think we could go with 5,000, turn adaptive size up, and um, use it as such like that. Let's see what happens with these settings and the setup. There's no guarantee this turns out right or perfect or anything for that matter. Uh, but we can see what's happening or occurring. And uh, it's not too bad. It's got some errors for sure. Uh, most of it did pretty well. It's that front top section didn't work out quite the way I wanted so uh, we'll try to tweak this a little usually bumping the quad counts up or down a little bit a lot of times will solve some situations but not always guaranteed either you can see it's getting closer but it's not quite there maybe just a little bit higher go to the 10,000 here and that's pretty close I probably have to clean this one up a little bit fortunately this edge just did not like doing anything right. But the rest of them look pretty spot on. You see, most of them are pretty good. This is a little off. I don't know what I would do about that one, though. That one's actually really interesting. And I have to figure that one out. And you can see this corner got a little bit off as well. Okay, and that's just something that might happen. Now, there is an add-on. You can download it's called curve face color if you run this set curve face color you got to be in face select to do it and if your mesh has errors it won't run just so you know it won't it won't curve face color it correctly and um it's going to create a lot of materials potentially it might hang your system up a little bit that happens but um we'll see what happens here in a second i guess it just hopefully it doesn't crash but um you'll set Basically, materials to each individual section, perhaps, like based on angles, is what's going to happen. If it didn't crash, that is. All right, so it crashed. And what we're going to do is just recover from autosave, do date modified, go to the newest one, and it should be the one that you were working on. So apparently, curved face color did not like that amount of faces or something. I don't know what happened there. Um, We'll try it one more time and see what happens with it again. It might be a bug. Who knows? It could be a bug. It could just be um, Blender doesn't like it or something. I don't know. I've never had problems adding adding uh, colors to anything yet like this anyways. So it could be an error in the mesh. And you know it, it would not work there either. So let's see what else we can do. Since we're not going to be able to rely on that, at this point on this particular shape, which you wouldn't think would be a big, big problem. Um, we'll have to try to do something else, perhaps. Oh, this is Mark Sharp. That might be part of the problem right there with that going crazy. That edge running through there like that as well might be a little bit of a problem. So we'll dissolve it. Use normal splitting, set it all up again if we need to, and let's let's uh, cross our fingers. That's the thing about quad remesher. Sometimes it just it's a hit or a miss. It actually worked out really well there. You can see mesh errors will cause it to not work always necessarily the best way possible. 
And so now I think I'd only have to clean up down here, perhaps. Which, um, by the looks of it, isn't too bad anyways. It just looks bad, but this is a quad. This is a little tight here. So I'll pull these down, and that'll hold that edge a little bit. And, oh, turn proportional, edit it off. It's on still, I guess. Yeah, so we could definitely work these things out here um, differently if we wanted to. There's definitely a way to work this to make it nicer, I think. So. Yeah. There's probably something different we can do here. The idea, I was thinking like doing this, but that's not not necessarily the best answer for that because we end up with the two triangles, right? Good try doing that. Okay, I'm starting to see something that might work. Okay. Yeah, a little bit nicer, I'd say. Perhaps. You want to avoid poles if possible. These poles are kind of going to cause the this smoothing here to just look a little bit off. But you can see when we subdivide, look how nice it looks. It's not too bad. This one could be better though, for sure. Uh, but the rest of this is going to subdivide now as well. Um, quite predictably at that. You see we got a little bit of an issue here. Okay, so this edge just did whatever kind of wanted to do here. So that stays down there. We'll balance it just by doing that. We'll change the shape a little bit, but it's not a big deal. This could be dissolved. I'm not going to get too crazy about that one. This here, this whole section could probably be brought down a little bit, or we could just leave it there. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, we, we worked through our subdivision issues now at this point. You can see the resolution created a little bit of a stepping effect through here. So if you're not at a high enough resolution on some things, you can see how that was weak there, it was low res. Um, it'll create that kind of effect sometimes in areas like that. So now there's two ideas here. You go back, you fix it, you remesh it again, right? Um, but occasionally you can get away with this, depending on the shape, where you just use a smooth, right? And so this is going to kind of maybe mess with some of you just for a moment, but you see how I can select this loop here? I can select inner loop region. Oh, it was a loop. I don't think it's technically a loop. No, it didn't work. Okay. Okay, there we go. Select inner loop region. I select loops, inner loop region. All right, you might have to hit select bigger or not. Anyways, uh, now that we've done that, we can hit control G, assign to a new vertex group. And so, Vertex groups are useful because almost all the modifiers can use them. A lot of them can anyways. Um, but you can assign a vertex group here. So if we were to change the factor to 1 and set it to like 25 um, or 55 or whatever, uh, what we'll see is that as we uh, use that vertex group, if we use it one way, it's like this. If we use it the other way, the ones we selected and added to the group, it'll smooth those down there. Okay. So we can actually work things like that out using the vertex group. So like here's your before. You see it's a little ribbed looking. And here's a, an after. It's still ribbed, but it's not as much. Maybe we can just bump that up even higher and smooth it more. Who knows? And uh, just lo localize it basically in that one area. You can do that on all sorts of different parts of this, this model as well. Which is good. So we can select sharps real quick. And I find that it just adding a crease to them a little bit, like 0.5. This makes it look a little bit nicer, a little bit sharper. Uh, but you do it does not always look the best it could possibly look. So you see, if we just subdivide this up a bit, you know, and we can go through and that vertex setup doesn't require a loop, by the way, guys. Like you can just literally select stuff. Any vertex that it touches basically is going to like you can assign control G's and you can assign to active group. So now it will smooth that area as well. You see how it creates this really cool effect too. Sometimes you might want to do things like that on purpose, but I think it's a pretty neat little effect. 
It doesn't work in this corner, but it does work everywhere else. So Ultimately, this is how you're going to be able to start taking your 3D game up a notch. You have to understand subdivision. You have to understand booleans, when tools are going to be utilized. You know, I, I hate seeing guys being kind of like misled in a way that they think that there's only like one way to model or like there's one workflow, like you're going to do booleans or you're going to do this. And no, you can use CAD software to start with a concept. You can, you know, maybe remesh it. You can just leave it as is, decimate it, whatever. All kinds of weird. You can start in CAD. You can use Blender. There's two different types of modeling programs, right? But you can use any of the tools available in anything. So it doesn't really matter what software you're in. Blender, at the end of the day, the tools that you're using, they're just your paintbrush to create whatever it is you want to create. And so when you're trying to establish yourself as a, as a digital artist, you know, pushing away from what the norm is, is probably the best thing you can do. Like trying to figure out how you can make your own kind of designs really come to life and, and show them off to a potential employer. It's getting tough out there, right, to get into AAA studios. There was a bunch of layoffs not long ago. And um, all those people that are extremely talented are going to other studios and taking positions. And those positions are forever gone in some of those other places. Well, maybe not forever, but they're, you're competing out there. If you're trying to get into AAA anyways, you're competing against the best of the best. I mean, they got they pick the best people for the jobs, right? The people that are the most talented and uh, most professional and whatnot. And that doesn't mean you can't 3D model elsewhere. But I just wanted to point that out, that you know you need to start pushing your, your tools to their limits. You need to start thinking about how to push your quality up to its limits. I know I show a lot of like really rough stuff on the channel, but it's never going to get you into one of those like top tier 3D modeling jobs, right? And so until you start thinking about things in that manner, like how can you work forms, shapes, how can you create good looking designs, you know, how can you utilize the tools that are available to you in an effective manner that's cost efficient or speed effective. Like this thing would be really a pain to just model um, as all subdivision. Like if we went through and pushed and pulled vertices all day long, it's not a cost effective uh, situation there. So, you know, you just have to, Really think about like what are you doing or what are you going for if you're going for a career anyways. Uh, game models a lot of times don't require subdivision at all. Okay, So Boolean Ngon can be quite useful. Uh, but understanding all of it, I think, like, you know, you need to, when you're building your portfolio, it just needs to scream like, I am a professional 3D artist. Not just some guy that picked up Blender. I'm a pro. I can do this stuff. I know I understand it at a fundamental level. And I can start making things like this happen, right? And especially, you know, focus on using other software as well. I know a lot of guys are like, hey, I don't want to learn, um, or they want to use Blender. They don't want to learn Max or Maya or ZBrush. You have to, well, you don't maybe have to in all situations, but um, a lot of the companies that are hiring, they want, they want you to know those things. They want you to know ZBrush. They want you to know Maya or Max, right? So even if you have Blender, there's still Indie license available for Max and Maya. That's the cheapest you're going to get it, $20 a month or something like that, $25 a month. And so you have to learn those softwares as well. Some of the job postings, when you look at them, they don't say nothing about Blender. Some of them say they want you to know Blender. And uh, a lot of them say still that they want you to understand ZBrush. So you know, you're going to be going through this process of trying to really establish yourself as a professional more than anything else and that's how you do it is by working uh, working the tools and, and just really not focusing on necessarily making big projects like you're not trying to establish your own intellectual property uh individual characters or whatever perhaps maybe maybe to a degree but portfolio pieces like that perhaps but not you're not doing like the next guardians of the galaxy or anything like that that's that's way out of that's out of scope for you okay that's all i'm going to say about that but I did want to point this all out in this video because, you know, you can have a lot of fun mixing hard surface with more organic stuff, creating forms, and shapes, all that fun stuff. And uh, so whenever I do videos from here on out, they're going to be a little bit more on schedule, uh, on a, like a planned schedule, just so it doesn't eat into my time as well. Because I have, I have environment art um, requests stacking up, right? I freelance still. And so as I'm getting into doing more environment art, you know, I, I can't focus on the YouTube as much. But I think this will be a nice happy medium. I hope you guys kind of enjoy um, 
these kinds of videos because they'll just kind of come out they'll trickle out little by little i think um over the coming year so hopefully you enjoy it and i'll check you out the next one all right take care